sermon lesson this morning comes from Matthew chapter 10. It's a little bit longer reading, so you can remain seated for this one. Behold, I am sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves, so be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. Beware of men, for they will deliver you over to courts and flog you in their synagogues, and you will be dragged before governors and kings for my sake, to bear witness before them and the Gentiles. And when they deliver you over, do not be anxious how you are to speak or what you are to say, for what you are to say will be given to you in that hour. For it is not you who speak, but the Spirit of your Father speaking through you. Brother will deliver brother over to death, and the father his child, and children will rise against parents and have them put to death, and you will be hated by all, uh, by all for my name's sake. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. And when they persecute you in one town, flee to the next. For truly I say to you, you will not have gone through the, all the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. A disciple is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. For it is enough for the disciple to be like his teacher, and the servant like his master. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebul, how much more will they malign those of his household? So have no fear for them, for nothing is covered that will, be, will not be revealed, or hidden that will not be known. What I tell you in the dark, say in the light, and what you hear whispered, proclaim to the, from the housetops. And do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? And not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. But even the hairs on your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore, you who are of more value than many sparrows. So everyone who acknowledges me before men, I also will acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a person's enemies will be those of his own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Whoever receives me, and whoever receives me, receives him who sent me. The one who receives a prophet, because he is a prophet, will receive a prophet's reward. And the one who receives a righteous person, because he is a righteous person, will receive a righteous person's reward. And whoever gives one of these little ones even a cup of cold water, because he is a disciple, truly I say to you, he will be by no means lose his reward. This is the gospel of the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your son. We thank you that he willingly suffered and endured on our behalf. We thank you for your word and for the ministry of your spirit in our lives. We thank you that even in the midst of suffering and persecution, that we can trust that you will be with us. We ask that you would speak to us now through your word that we would indeed be prepared for persecution and suffering when we must face it. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Perhaps you've heard this expression. It's, it's, it's a quip almost. Uh, one, of, one of my favorites, actually. Uh, no good deed goes unpunished often attributed to Oscar Wilde. It's actually a lot older than that. It dates to a 12th century Latin work by some guy named Walter Mapp. Never, never heard of him. It was called A Courtier's Trifles. It's sort of a, a sardonic play, if you will, uh, on Thomas Aquinas' ethical principles. He, you know, he set forth this principle that uh, 
because God is all-powerful and he's a good and just judge, every good deed would be rewarded and every bad deed would be punished. Of course, what the expression is getting at is the unfortunate reality that people often do not want to be helped. So good deeds or even kind words are sometimes met with criticism, rejection, and even on occasion abuse. The first time one experiences this response can be kind of, kind of a rude awakening, but sadly it's fairly common. As Christians, I think perhaps we experience this a fair bit and maybe more than we expect. And one reason is that we can get it for basic acts of kindness, like, like anyone might do for someone in need, but also for evangelistic efforts. There we are offering to them the greatest gift that we've ever received, right? We tell them about how Jesus died for their sins and offers eternal life and a healing of all things and, and all of this good stuff. There's a reason we call it good news, and yet it's received as if it's bad news. The reality is, as much as the gospel is good news, it comes with a confrontation. To accept that Jesus died for my sins, uh, well, that means that I have to be a sinner. And while that might be easy enough for most people to accept in terms of peccadillos and, and small issues, uh, he's not just, we're not just sinners. We're sinners that deserve death and sinners that Christ had to die for. And most of us don't like to think of ourselves as deserving to be on death row. And so telling someone this is essentially to initiate a conflict, particularly if they're unreceptive towards it. But in reality, it's initiating a conflict even when they receive it well. And so the Christian life, to the degree that you really live it for Christ, is often met with persecution, ranging from sort of, you know, passive aggressiveness to just flat-out violence. But it's just not what we expect. And in our passage today, Jesus is going to say, expect it. Today is the continuation of the teaching we began last week. If you remember, he sends out the 12 apostles and he gives instructions to them for a mission to go to the different towns in Israel and uh, basically take up his ministry to proclaim the good news, to heal the sick, to cast out demons, to do the same kind of miracles that Jesus has been doing. And now we're going to get the second half, really the second two-thirds of his teaching on that matter. And what began with pretty specific instructions, right, about how to go about things, uh, where to go, where not to go, what to do if they're rejected, uh, like shake the dust off their feet as they leave the town. Uh, but even with that, I think that uh, the disciples would probably have had, I don't know, they'd probably been pretty excited about this. I mean, imagine, you're going to have the power that Jesus had. You're going to perform miracles. That's pretty exciting stuff, and you'd expect people to receive that pretty enthusiastically, at least in most cases. So I think they were feeling good about it, but Jesus is now going to say, guess what, guys? No good deed goes unpunished. Expect to be rejected, not just rejected, but actually to be persecuted. Now, there's another different feature to this part of the teaching from the first part. And that is, there's a sort of a more general sense to it, a, a broaderness. Uh, the first part was very specific to this particular mission. But a lot of this teaching applies more broadly to ministry in general and to you know, what the disciples and apostles would be doing far after Jesus uh, is ascended to the Father. For example, it begins to mention ministry to Gentiles, something that he had previously just specifically forbidden them to do uh, in this mission. And so it anticipates worse persecution as well, things that will come later in their ministry. And so there's a more general sense to this, this second part that sort of applies broadly to ministry in general, even for ours. 
Now, we're going to see three things in this passage. The first is that Christians should indeed expect persecution and sufferings in this life and in ministry because we follow Christ. The second is how we should respond to that persecution and suffering. And the third is about the positive reward that we can expect to see from our proclamation of the gospel, even in the midst of suffering and, and trials that will come. So Jesus begins this part with a stern warning about the nature of the mission, both this one in specific and sort of mission in general. He's sending us out as sheep to wolves. We're on the wrong side of the food chain here, right? And because of this, he says that we need to be wise as serpents and innocent as doves, which is to say we should be very shrewd in how we deal with others while remaining guileless as well. And there's nothing to be gained by needless suffering or martyrdom, but at the same time, we mustn't lie or deceive or even be disingenuous, right? We have to go through the mission and proclaim the good news. Now, he's going to get more specific. He says that the persecutions will take on a formal nature for them, right? The government, authorities, and people like that will be involved. There may be disciplinary beatings, trials, and hearings, and so forth. Now, remember, the disciples back then did not enjoy the religious freedoms or general attitude of tolerance that we enjoy in this country today. But even with that, he expects that they will actually have an opportunity to share the gospel and do the work of evangelism in these hearings, right, as they're being punished and disciplined. And he even says that they don't need to worry about what to say in such scenarios, but that the Holy Spirit will give them the words. Now, I don't mind telling you this has been used as an excuse by more than one preacher to come unprepared to a sermon. That's not what this justifies, and that shouldn't be happening. Jesus even warns them of how ministry will tear apart families. The family uh, in the ancient time was much more uh, tight-knit, I guess, than it is now something perhaps we lament in some ways. It's a very important social structure in the society. And part of that was it was assumed that everyone in the family would participate in the religion of the father, right? The, the pater familias, the head of the household. And so conversions to Christianity often led to entire household conversions, which is a great thing, right? Uh, in the case of Lydia, uh, in the case of the Corinthian jailer, we see examples of that. But what happens if a son converts to Christianity or, or a daughter converts to Christianity and the rest of the family does not? It would start to tear the family a lot apart, right? They are expected to participate in the religion of the father. And even today, right, this can still be very hard on families where everyone is not a Christian. Now, verse 23 is kind of interesting and a little bit tricky to interpret. The first part is simple enough. If the disciples are persecuted in one place, move on to the next town, right? Get out of there. This is basically just a repetition of the instructions that were given to them for their mission the last time. But what does that last part mean? You will not have gone through all of the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. Well, the first thing I think we can eliminate is one of uh, more common interpretations, and that is that Jesus is referring to his second coming in judgment, because clearly that doesn't happen during the time of the apostles, and certainly not during their mission to the towns of Israel. So I think this is better understood as Jesus coming in his resurrection, at which point the gospel would go forth beyond the boundaries of Israel to the Gentiles, which would, of course, be expressed in the Great Commission, which you give at the end of Matthew, just before he ascends into heaven. Now, all of this persecution comes as a response to evangelism and the mission of the 12 apostles. But in verses 24 and 25, Jesus makes it clear that we will experience rejection and persecution just because of who we are as Christians. That is, we will experience persecution just be by being associated with the name of Jesus. We will be hated for his name's sake. A disciple is not greater than his teacher or a servant greater than his master. If Jesus was persecuted, and here, of course, we, 
we know that this is kind of looking at persecution that is to come, then how much more can we who follow him expect to receive the same? And while this probably has the crucifixion ultimately in view, he already sees what is to come in the fact that the Pharisees called him Beelzebul. Beelzebul being, or Beelzebub as it's sometimes written, one of the names for Satan. But he had already mentioned him earlier, right? Matthew 9, 34, the Pharisees accuse him of casting out demons by the prince of demons. Yet another appellation for Satan. So they're already calling him that. It can't bode well for the disciples. So persecution and suffering are, in fact, normal for the Christian life, even normative. To whatever extent we are living for Christ, we should be experiencing a degree of pushback. Which raises the question, honestly, why don't we experience more persecution now? First, I think it's worth noting that Christians worldwide actually experience quite a bit of persecution. We have the benefit of living in a country where our religious freedoms are protected and our sort of tolerance of our views is encouraged. But I think it's also worth questioning whether or not we as a church, and I mean not just us specifically, but the Christian church in general, have compromised too much, are more, or perhaps more interested in power and comfort than we are in the gospel. Further, I think it's worth examining whether we as individuals are proclaiming Christ and the gospel in our lives. Do people know more about your politics or your faith? Which would they say are more important to you? Is it Jesus that's more important, or is it your stuff, maybe? If they don't think Christ is your primary identity and the most important thing in your life, are they likely to give you grief for it? You know, I think this is one of the reasons why people really like for us to keep our faith private. Because then they want to avoid conflict too. And they get frustrated if we make it public. Now, the next question that follows from this is, if persecution and suffering are normal for Christians, how are we to respond to it? Do you know what the most common command is in the whole Bible? I'll give you a hint. It's not any of the Ten Commandments. It's do not fear. It's all over the place. And it's exactly what Jesus says here. Have no fear of them. Why? I mean, he's just promised that some pretty scary things are going to happen. Why not be afraid? Well, the first thing he says is don't fear them because everything that is unknown will be known. There will come a day when there'll be no more secrets, and God will be the judge of the earth, and the truth of our faith will reveal, be revealed, and everyone will give an account to him. So proclaim the truth out loud for everyone, right? Shout it from the rooftops. Do not fear the one that could kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. There is one who can kill both. Fearing those that would persecute or harm us in this life is fearing the wrong person. You should fear God, the one that can send you to hell. He's the one that we really have to answer to. And ultimately, this is why we spread the good news. To begin with, our sin is high treason against God. We deserve the death penalty for it, and he will ultimately enforce it. But Jesus died in our place, and he took our sin on his body, on the cross. So we fear the one that we celebrate because of his grace and his love shown to us. It's, it's kind of backwards, if you will, for us to fear other people after embracing the grace of Jesus Christ. But further than this, our God is all-knowing and all-powerful. He's the sovereign creator, and he's the one that knows every precious ounce of his creation and of us. And so he says that not even a sparrow can fall to the ground without him granting that is so. Sparrows were the, basically the cheapest items sold in the marketplace. Two for a penny, and a, uh, a Roman penny was a, a little copper coin, uh, the lowest denomination of currency they had. It's called an Assyrian, and you could get two sparrows for, for one of those. And so it was the food of the poor. And if the Father values even the sparrow, he values you many times more. 
God has bothered to number the hairs on your head. So fear not. God has a plan, and he's in control. Now note, this is not a guarantee of physical safety in this life. Most of the 12 apostles died as martyrs. I think John was the one exception, and he was boiled in oil and had his eyes plucked out. Not a good outcome. But rather, it's a promise of eternal blessing, right? So everyone who acknowledges me before men, I will also acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven, but whoever denies me before men, I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. So the reason we do not fear, but proclaim Christ anyway, is because he will claim us in heaven. Then Jesus returns to the fact that this suffering and persecution are normal. Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. The thing about Jesus is he demands absolute allegiance. The gospel is a free gift. It's gracious and it's unearned and it's free to all. However, not everyone will accept the good news and the gospel divides. It cuts like a sword. And then he returns to this idea of divided families again. Because Christ demands allegiance even before father and mother. Now the idea here is about our priorities. In the face of persecution, even from our own families, we must prioritize Christ first. This does not mean that we should not love our parents or our children or our siblings. Certainly we should do all of this. But our first priority still has to be Christ because of the gospel, even if it ends up dividing us from our families. Ultimately, we have to live for Christ and follow him. We have to take up our crosses, which means we have to bear our burdens and our persecutions and follow him no matter what. That's what it means, actually, to follow him. And even if we lose our very lives for him, we will find our lives in eternal blessing. And this really points us to the rewards that we receive for following Christ. What's interesting is the rewards Jesus talks about for the proclamation of the gospel are found in those who receive it. It's not about us. It's about them. Whoever receives you receives me, and whoever receives me receives him who sent me. The one who receives a prophet because he is a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. It's the people that receive the disciples with joy who reap the reward. It's not that we won't receive a reward for proclaiming the gospel. We will. This is what it means to have him acknowledge us before the Father. And it's implied further that if they will receive a prophet's reward by receiving the good news, then right, we who share the good news will receive a prophet's reward as well. But the focus here is not on the one who shares the good news, but on the benefit of the one who receives it. And that is our reward, too, to see the good news go forth and rejoice in those that believe. You know, some have asked it sometimes, you know, if God is sovereign and everything's going to come to pass and he's predestined certain people, then why should we evangelize? I mean, they're going to be converted one way or the other anyway, right? But then we won't get the reward of participating in their faith, of seeing them come to believe. Now, the thing that's most striking to me in, in all of this, most stunning thing, is that suffering and persecution are not just to be expected, but it's the plan. It's actually a strategy for evangelism. Persecution for the sake of Christ is an opportunity to talk further about the gospel. Christians may well be victims, I suppose, in many things in this life, but we don't get to be victims for Christ because it's, it's what we sign up for. Uh, I think I mentioned before that my dad was a veterinarian. I, I worked in his vet clinic a lot uh, as a kid, particularly in my teen years, uh, and some later on in other vet clinics as well. And I had uh, the joy of holding on to dogs and cats, sometimes very large mean dogs, while my dad or the other vets did uncomfortable 
ranging to painful things to them, right? That's why I was holding on to them, so they could do something they really didn't want to have done. And as you can imagine, they would try to get away from this. At times, they would become violent and angry. They're scared. They're hurting. They're lashing out. I'm always at the front end where the teeth are. For some reason, the vets always planned it that way. And so as you can imagine, I got bitten, and I got scratched on more than one occasion. Now, I guess you could say I was a victim in a technical sense. I mean, I was bleeding, after all. But I wasn't really, and I certainly didn't have time to get to be one. I had to hold on, or it was going to get worse. It was the job. It's what I, I signed up for. I knew the risks going into it. And we took precautions. We were wise about what we were doing. When necessary, we'd even sedate them. Because we expected it. And I also knew that ultimately what we were doing was for these animals good. Even if they didn't like it and didn't understand what was going on, I still got hurt sometimes. As Christians, our job is to tell people about Jesus. We need to do it wisely and graciously, but we still need to do it. And it's not always going to go well. And some people aren't going to like it, and they're not going to like us just because we are Christians regardless of what we say or do. But we have to see moments like these as opportunities, opportunities for evangelism, for sanctification, for Christ's glory, not opportunities to defend ourselves or mourn our victimhood or even lick our wounds. Christians exist and the church exists for the sake of others. If we aren't here for them, Maybe we should all just be baptized and held under, right? Think about it. What other thing in the Christian life that we do could we not do better in heaven? We worship better. We'd be more sanctified. We'd, everything would be better. Except evangelism. Meeting other sinners and telling them about Jesus. It's why we're here. We're here to suffer for the sake of the gospel and others. Now, this is like the worst sermon ever, right? Total, total downer. It's Jesus' fault, not mine. Look, to be sure, the Christian life isn't all about abuse and persecution and suffering. We still get to take great joy in God's beautiful creation in fellowship with one another, in giving him glory in our worship, in raising our children, in doing good, and contributing good to society, in our, in our work, in fulfilling right, our purpose in this world. And there is much to enjoy in it. But the last thing we should do is be surprised by persecution and suffering when it comes, because it is part of the plan and the strategy. So remember, no good deed goes unpunished. Jesus isn't the only one that said stuff like this. James puts it like this. He says, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And Peter said, But rejoice in so far as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. And our hope is this, that we will one day get to be there when the glory of Christ is revealed and all things will be made new with no more tears and no more sorrow no more suffering and no more persecution and we will get to celebrate with our risen and victorious Lord Amen Amen Let's pray Father it is difficult for us to thank you for suffering but we hope that you will help us to find opportunity when persecution and suffering comes our way, that we might indeed celebrate the wonders of the gospel and the privilege it is to suffer on behalf of Christ. Lord, prepare us for these things. Do indeed give us not just the words in those moments, but the courage as well. May all of these things draw us nearer to you, and form us more into the likeness of Christ. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Brothers and sisters, let's now stand and in response to the preaching.